This lecture is about uh, some case studies, running briefly through a number of case studies from different parts of the world, and looking at some of the lessons that we've learned for environmental flow assessment uh, and implementation, and for uh, training groups of people in different parts of the world to uh, carry out environmental flows. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is to present some joint studies, most of which uh, were joint between uh, the WWF uh, in different parts of the world and the UNESCO IHE um, with, and at various scopes um, to train groups of local specialists to carry out environmental flow assessments. And what I want to do is draw some, some of the lessons on what may work and what may not in different parts of the world. Okay, so um, these, uh, the, the, I'm not going to talk about all these cases, but these are some of the places that we have been working around the world over the last um, five or six years. Um, the, in Central and Southern America, in East and Southern Africa, in Eastern Europe, in Pakistan, India, and China. So quite a, a wide geographical scope. And the training model that we've developed as we've gone along, which uh, is modified to suit local context for each particular project, but is basically to see environmental flow assessment as part of a WWF basin planning program. Now, WWF um, regional offices are carrying out a number of basin planning programs around the world, and uh, it was very effective to do the environmental flow assessment part of the program as part of those basin programs. So the regional office would select local specialist team for training, so local hydrologists, hydraulics, ecologists, water quality, socioeconomists, and, and so on, geomorphologists. Once that's been set up, we would have an initial week of environmental flow training, which would culminate in a choice of the suitable method, usually holistic method, for that particular river in that particular region. This would be followed by between six months and two years of data collection by the local specialists, and then uh, a one-week assessment workshop at which all the specialists would come together and uh, reach some sort of consensus on the flow recommendations for that particular river. So from UNESCO IHE's point of view, the initial week and the, uh, the final assessment workshop would be on-site, staff on-site in the, in the uh, uh, river basin being dealt with, working with the specialists, and the six months to two years of data collection would be remote via email, teleconferences, and so on. And then the idea was to choose a second uh, river environmental flow assessment facilitated by the local team, who would have the expertise, with on-site mentoring from uh, members of UNESCO IHE. And following the second project, the, uh, the hope and assumption, uh, which has turned out to be true, is that you then have a local team who are capable of carrying out um, this process um, by themselves. Okay, so um, if we look at some of the case studies, this is one of the first ones that we tried with WWF India on the Gambiri River. Now, the Gambiri River is a formerly perennial river, which is now extremely dry, and you can see that uh, even the uh, attempts to grow crops in the river channel, this is the river channel that we're looking at, have been given up because it's too dry, and in fact, this river now is really, only, the riverbed is only used for burying bodies. And the, the important lesson that came out of this is that for a first training, try to choose a river where there's a good chance of implementing environmental flows. It's always very uh, tempting to use the important crisis-hit, stressed rivers first, but those are the ones where you're least likely to get uh, positive results in the short term. And when you're starting off the environmental flows process, it's important to be able to have um, an, an initial project which so shows some results, shows that it can be done so that people um, uh, believe in the process. Okay, secondly, uh, the lower Indus River in Pakistan. There's in, in, in the Indus, uh, because of very large barrages, um, upstream diverting water, there is now 
by and large, apart from the recent floods during the dry season, there is no flow at all in this uh, delta region for about 150 kilometers up, up the river, with the result that the, uh, uh, the, the water, the, there's uh, saline intrusion up the river, so the water can't be used for irrigation. The fishery, the commercial fishery of the delta has been changed completely. Um, there's much less sediment coming down into the delta region, which is eroding away. The mangroves are being reduced or are, are being uh, cut down and uh, are also um, dying off because of the changes in salinity. And so the whole delta region is being destabilized. And there are hundreds of thousands of people whose livelihoods depend on the delta region. So the Pakistan government um, wanted to uh, reinstitute some freshwater flows during the dry season. Now, they, they chose a team without experience, a local team without experience or training in environmental flows, who came up with a, quite a simplistic um, uh, recommendation. Um, and then we were called in to review the process that had been carried out, we as UNESCO IHE, by WWF uh, Pakistan, who wanted to know should they support this uh, this process and the recommended flows and after reviewing what had been done which was by no means um, perfect or very defensible we we concluded that um, really when a river is already over allocated and you've got no flow during the dry season rather get some flow going so in other words accept these um, rather simplistic recommendations um, for the moment um, and then refine them in, in the future, but make sure you get some flow down the river because that's, that's the short-term uh, priority. Okay, then uh, we did quite an extensive two, uh, two, two and a half year project with WWF India on the Ganga River, the, the mother river of India, um, which is incredibly complicated. It has um, hundreds of millions of, uh, of people living in the basin and depending on the river. It has very important spiritual and cultural uh, affiliations as well as the ecological uh, requirements. So we worked with a, a local team over this two and a half years on the upper and middle parts uh, from Gangotri to Kampur and uh, came up uh, earlier this year with recommendations. What was interesting about this case study was that the social, cultural, cultural and spiritual issues in the Ganga are primary. It's the mother river of India. Everybody in India wants to come to visit the river, to bathe in the river. Um, so there are strong ecological considerations. For instance, the, the uh, river dolphins. Um, but uh, the, the, these spiritual issues were primary in this case. But what was interesting that the, the spiritual requirements, the requirements for people to have reasonably clean water of a reasonable depth to be able to bathe themselves in, also turned out to be very similar to the requirements of the ecological um, uh, issues in the river, especially during the dry season, in terms of maintaining dolphin habitat, uh, maintaining the uh, fishing potential, um, maintaining water quality requirements and so on. So those indicators turned out to be very strongly linked um, and provided powerful support for each other. Okay, then another large river, the San Francisco River in, in Brazil. Um, this is a river which has been extensively impounded mainly for hydroelectric uh, generation and um, one of the consequences of the impoundments, um, there are about five large impoundments down the river, uh, the, and we were looking at the final uh, part of the river to the river mouth on the coast um, with uh, the uh, final reservoir had been built about um, 50 kilometers upstream. And one of the consequences of the reservoirs was that it had taken out a, a very large percentage of the um, of the high sediment loads which uh, which formerly characterized the river so there you can see down on the uh, bottom left hand picture the natural turbidity of the river before it was impounded and the bottom right hand picture showing that the water is now much clearer 
and that the river banks um, have been extensively eroded away and the, the river channel has been incised, um, cutting it off largely from, from um, much of its floodplain. The other uh, very striking example of, uh, of, this, uh, of the consequences of the lack of sediment in those middle pictures, on the left you can see uh, a lighthouse in a, in a, uh, um, with a village behind it, uh, at the uh, river mouth, the river in the background. This was 25 years ago, just before the final dam was uh, closed um, 50 kilometers upstream. And now you can see on the right-hand middle picture that that same lighthouse now stands nearly a kilometer offshore with the uh, coastal uh, land having been eroded away by the sediment-hungry water. And that village has had to be completely uh, relocated. So there are major um, issues going on in, in terms of the uh, flow and particularly sediment requirements and the floodplain connection of the river. We were able in this case to use uh, quite a, a large scale model, a hydraulic model, to demonstrate for different flows. This is 1300 cubic meters per second, 3500 cubic meters per second. Uh, 4,000 cubic meters per second, 6,000 cubic meters per second, we were able to show which areas of the landscape and the river channel would be inundated at these different flows, which was very useful at the large scale to get a, a, an overview of the consequences of uh, different flows in the river. So the lesson here is that even very large rivers need environmental flows uh, need an assessment of what kind of flows, what flow variability, and so on. But the emphasis in these large rivers may well need to be on macro processes such as floodplain uh, flood connections, such as um, sediment transport and channel morphology, rather than the habitat and ecological indicators on which many of the um, environmental flow assessment methods have initially been developed. So I don't think we're... Uh, um, at a stage with these very large river assessments where we've solved all these problems, but at least we recognize how the different methodologies should be um, modified in, in terms of these kinds of large rivers. Okay, then uh, I, I want to look at two examples from East Africa. First of all, in this part of the, uh, the Kenya-Tanzania um, uh, cross-border uh, basin, the Mara River, which I've mentioned before. Um, the Mara catchment, which rises in uh, Kenya on the Mau escarpment in a, an, an area that was very richly forested but is now being deforested, uh, flows down into the iconic Ma Maasai Mara and Serengeti protected areas in green there on the slide, and then flows out of them uh, westwards and into the uh, Lake Victoria at Musoma. So one of, one of the major issues in, in terms of the uh, Mara River Basin is the annual migration, mostly within the protected areas, of more than uh, 1.5 million wildebeest who uh, travel from the Maasai Mara in the north down to the, uh, the uh, Serengeti National Park during the wet season when there's good grazing uh, down south and then they, uh, as, as the dry season approaches, they uh, migrate back northwards up to the Mara River, which is the only perennial water that flows into the, uh, through, the, through these protected areas. So, and and uh, this migration provides for some 30% of the, uh, the uh, foreign revenue of both Kenya and Tanzania in terms of ecotourism. So it's very important from a number of points of view. There, I'm sure you're all familiar with pictures um, shown all over the world of the wildebeest approaching the river and diving in and, and crossing it. Um, and there, there are also the, uh, the associated uh, large mammals and, and predators and aquatic uh, animals, hippos and, and crocodiles, which depend very heavily, obviously, on the river. And apart from that, there's the, uh, the cultural and social issues. This is the uh, traditional homeland of the Maasai, um, who are um, 
dependent on, on these landscapes for grazing their cattle and who also contribute considerably to the, uh, the tourism potential of the area. So you've got the headwaters uh, and the Mao forest which is uh, being deforested quite considerably. Then you've got some, uh, some intensive uh, irrigated crop farming, the, uh, the traditional grazing mostly by the Maasai just outside the uh, Maasai Mara, uh, then the protected areas, Maasai Mara and the Serengeti, uh, some mining uh, near the river as it leaves the protected areas, then a very extensive uh, wetland area just uh, before the river flows into Lake Victoria at Musoma. Okay, so this river is not in any way extensively uh, impounded at the moment. There are one or two small impoundments in the upper reaches and there's some irrigation abstraction. But by and large, the, most of the flow regime is... Um, is still there, still in the river. It, the patterns may have been modified by the land use changes, particularly the deforestation, but essentially most of the flow that was in the river is still in the river. So when most of the flow is still unused, it's worth spending time and money on a very high confidence environmental flow assessment because this is going to be used, hopefully, if it's high confidence and if people... Um, take to it, it's going to be used in the future planning for the river. So it's well worth making the effort to do this in some detail and with high confidence. Okay, these as I've shown in previous lectures, uh, some of the results for site three on the Tanzanian, Kenya-Tanzanian border, um, with the brown and green lines representing the recommended base and higher flows um, uh, compared to the blue line, which is the, the present day flows at, at this site. Um, and what you can see is that the recommended flows are well below the present day flows in, in the river. So the lesson here, we have a long term average environmental flow assessment, which uh, comes to about 50% of the uh, present flow. So the lesson here is that sometimes an environmental flow assessment can reassure stakeholders that there's still plenty of water for all purposes. So in the future planning of the river, there's still a lot of potential for using water from the, uh, the river without necessarily um, uh, degrading the river to an unacceptable uh, state. Okay, however, during drought years, what you can see is that the recommended flows uh, are, are higher than the present day flows. And that's because during drought flows, the water requirements, particularly from the upper catchment, don't diminish. In fact, if anything, they increase. And the, the flow, the natural flow, which in drought years during the dry season uh, goes below one cubic meter per second, is not enough to... Uh, to provide for all the requirements and for the environmental flows. So here you've got a specific, maybe once every 10 years or so on average, when you've got a bad drought year during the dry season, you've got a, a water shortage. So the result here is that the environmental flow assessment can help negotiations by defining when there will be shortages of water. And in this case, to allow... Um, the, the planners to put in place some requirements such as on on farm storage to provide for irrigation requirements during the dry season during drought years so that the the diminished flow can at least um, uh, continue down the the river okay so one of the other outcomes or possible outcomes which hasn't been finalized by any means yet is to look at what are the uh, what are the opportunities and advantages and costs uh, and benefits of uh, of providing these um, flows down the river or leaving those flows in the river because they're already in the river and one of the requirements is that for the protected areas particularly there's a requirement obviously for water to flow down the river because it's the only perennial water in those protected areas. But as a result, uh, 
the, there's a requirement for the people who are settling in the upper catchment and who are deforesting the upper catchment to be more careful and to desist. So that would require some kind of incentive, <coughs> money being the simplest incentive, for them to stop doing that and, and to uh, agree to, um, to not to, to develop or deforest the upper catchment. Uh, and there is a lot of money that is being earned in the, in the protected areas um, which could be used as payment for ecological services. Similarly, the uh, crop farmers, um, uh, if they're asked to uh, not to reduce but not to increase um, their, their water requirements too substantially, also need to be in some way compensated for their loss of development opportunities. The, the uh, Maasai grazing um, uh, farmers are already receiving quite a substantial um, percentage of the um, gate takings from the Maasai Mara. So in that, in that sense, the uh, payment for ecological services for the loss of their, <coughs> some of their traditional grazing lands um, is already being compensated for. But there are, uh, and, and it's obviously the tourism, which is the um, big earner in this area, which could provide that money for payment for ecological services. There are some big advantages. Often a transboundary river is seen as a big problem between the two countries, but there are some considerable advantages in negotiation. Because Tanzania is the downstream uh, uh, part of the basin they they have the water requirements but the water is is being um is being provided in the upper catchment mainly most of the discharge so that tanzania is able to um put pressure on on um, the kenyan part of the basin to provide those requirements uh, under international law and within the east african community um, rather than um, just developing the water, all the water for their, for their own use within Kenya. Um, there are still big uh, unknowns. Uh, the requirements for the Tanzanian wetland uh, at the mouth of the river, uh, what the effects of the mining are, and uh, what are the effects of the flows in terms of maintaining the uh, near shore ecosystem in Lake Victoria where the outflow is. So there are still many questions to be answered, um, but there has been a, a good start made and the Basin Authority has accepted the uh, initial assessment of the environmental flow requirements as part of the future planning of the basin. Okay, in contrast, in many ways very similar, but with very contrasting uh, environmental flow requirements, the Great Ruaha River and Usanga wetlands in central Tanzania, where um, as a result mainly of rice growing, um, um, but also upland clearance and uh, wetland evapotranspiration, there have been no flows in the middle reaches of the Ruaha River in the Ruaha Natural, National Park during the, uh, since the early 1990s. Okay, previously again a, a perennial river, but now with no flow during the dry season in the national park. Okay, there's the Ruahan National Park, which was the uh, central uh, uh, focus of this, uh, this project. Um, again, in terms of uh, uh, WWF appointing a local team, many of whom were involved on the, on the Mara assessment so this was in that sense the, the second um, their second experience of uh, environmental flow assessment um, to look at what are the requirements in the Ruaha National Park so we're looking at the middle reaches of the river from the green area there which is the Usanga wetlands down to the uh, uh, through the National Park and down to the Mtira and Kidatu dams which provide hydroelectric power for Dar es Salaam Okay, so it's that middle section of the river where the dry season flows are no longer uh, flowing. Okay, now, because there was no water in the, uh, in the national park during the dry season, or the only very isolated pools, this was creating enormous pressure in terms of the 
uh, of animals needing water to drink in terms of very large uh, densities of hippos and crocodiles in terms of overgrazing around these remnant pools um, so that the whole uh, national park ecosystem was under threat and therefore in these sort of circumstances uh, like in the Indus in, in uh, the lower Indus in Pakistan it's very important to get some flow down the the uh, middle reaches of the river during the dry season rather than to spend uh, a long time and a lot of um, resources on a, on a very detailed environmental flow assessment. So here's the contrast between the Mara River where most of the water was still in the, in the river, uh, we're not yet in a, a flow crisis, so that we could spend the time and the effort to make a very detailed high confidence assessment as opposed to the Ruaha where we're looking at how can we get just some flow to maintain the, uh, the middle reaches of the river during the dry season. So rather than doing a very extensive environmental flow assessment, we actually looked at options for getting some flow at least in the short term and maybe then some longer term more sustainable options of getting some flow down into the, the middle reaches of the river. And the options that were looked at was upland storage where you could have some reservoir in the upper part of the catchment which would provide for the dry season requirements of the irrigated area which was upstream of the uh, wetlands and the middle reaches of the river. That was one option. A second option was to transfer water from a tributary, the Indambira uh, River, which flows in from the east in that light brown, uh, um, uh, bel just below the light brown line, and there is a, a uh, temporary uh, river which flows more or less parallel to it, which is the brown line, and which comes in uh, down below the outlet to the Ihefu swamp, which is the downstream part of the wetland. So the idea there was that rather than allowing the water from the Indimbira River to flow into the wetland during the dry season, where most of it would uh, evapotranspirate before it uh, came into the middle reaches of the river, to bypass the wetland in terms of this temporary river channel um, and to provide some flow directly into the middle reaches of the Ruaha River as a temporary um, trade-off between uh, some uh, reduction in the area of the, of the wetland um, uh, compared to at least providing some flow in the river downstream of the wetland. Then uh, in longer term, one would need to be looking at more efficient irrigation. At the, most, at the moment, it's mostly flood irrigation, possibly groundwater use for irrigation, although one would have to be very clear about how that might impact on the uh, base flows during the dry season. Um, then there was even the option to perhaps, in terms of the yellow line there, to engineer the wetland to, to uh, channelize water straight through the wetland rather than it being um, uh, spreading out over the wetland and evapotranspirating, um, which would provide some flow downstream. And in fact, the, the option of choice in the, in the short term would be the transfer from the Indambira, which was felt to provide significant benefits for the middle reaches of the river during the dry season with very small costs to the uh, inflow to the wetland during that time. So the lesson here is that when all the flow has been removed in the dry season in this case, concentrate on some immediate flow restoration, then monitor and refine rather than um, putting all the resources into an environmental flow assessment. Okay, and here's the WWF team for the Great Ruaha. Three of the specialists, as I mentioned, were also part of the Mara team, and all the specialists have some experience of environmental flow assessment on Tanzanian rivers, such as the Pangani and the Ruvu, Ruvu where other projects have been done. So we now have, within uh, Tanzania, a, a team who are capable uh, and self-sufficient to, uh, to carry out the environmental flow assessment process on any of their rivers. Okay, so just to take out a few of the general lessons being learned, 
Um, first of all, to be demand-driven and work with a locally-based organising team. As I mentioned before, working with the local WWF teams on these projects provided a very good um, introduction uh, to the region and, uh, um, and an acceptance of the process and allowed the appropriate local specialist to be uh, used and trained. Use methods appropriate to the local conditions, okay, the difference between the Mara River and the Ruaha River, although both rise upstream and flow through national parks, the situations in each is very difficult, different, and the approaches used was therefore uh, 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 very different. Try to work with, uh, with specialists who are committed to continuing the process. There's no point in a, a one-off training which then goes nowhere. You need for the local, uh, the local specialist, the local team, to take the process on. Uh, choose methods appropriate to the resources available. Again, uh, if you don't have um, reasonable hydrological uh, data, then uh, it's uh, difficult to justify detailed ecological investigations because the hydrology is going to um, be the, 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 the lack of hydrological data will limit the confidence in the answers, however good the ecological data is. Okay, plan an exit strategy in terms of the, uh, the uh, training team so that the local team have to take responsibility for implementation and as we've done in uh, Tanzania. A clear locally tailored workshop structure is required applied uh, fle flexibly. So people work differently in, in different regions. It's, it's important to have the process under the control of a local team such as the local WWF office who understand how, how things can best be and most effectively be implemented. The selection of a lo local facilitator or co coordinator is a key outcome of capacity building. You need a champion to take the process on, so it's very important for the local, uh, local team during the training to identify one of their number as the appropriate person to take to lead the process from there on. Where environmental flows are being introduced as a new concept to a region, try to start with a relatively simple project e.g. in a small subcatchment not yet over allocated, a successful demonstration is worth a lot more than a lot of theory and lecturing. Thank you very much. <laughs>